evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight. Comedian and singer Mark Trevorrow. The Minister for Education, Christopher Pine. Human rights lawyer, Pallavi Sinha. Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, John Roskam. And the Labor member for Chisholm, former Parliamentary Speaker, Anna Burke. Please welcome our panel. Now, as usual, being simulcast on ABC News 24 News Radio, and you can join the Twitter conversation or send us a question by Twitter using the Quanda hashtag on your screen. Well, our first question tonight comes from Riley Griffin. Hi. Um, I go to Youth Connections, an alternative Year 11 program on the Central Coast. This class is for kids like me who are unable to attend any other school, but we have to go to school because we are not yet 17. We are told that in the May budget, the Youth Connections and Partner Broker schemes will not be refunded and there is nothing to take the place of these programs. Some young people are not ready for work and have lots of issues such as homelessness, drug and alcohol abuse, depression, anxiety and we don't have much money. My question is, Minister Pine, what will you and your government do to, for kids like me and my mates when the Youth Connections and Partnership Broker programs are gone in January next year? Christopher Pine. Uh, well, Riley, the Youth Connections and Partnerships Broker programs were established in 2010 for three years, uh, and the Labor Party, when they were in government, funded them for one extra year. So that was one of those lovely landmines that they left for the incoming government because uh, uh, they You're calling this program a landmine, are you? It sounds like it's actually doing some good, whereas landmines kill people. <laughs> well, I actually hadn't finished my opening sentence, Tony, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if that's go. the way we're going to do it tonight, that's fine. But <laughs> No, uh, I wasn't describing the programs as a landmine. I was describing Labor's uh, only funding it for one year so that it finished in the first year of a coalition government as laying a landmine for the incoming government. That's what they did in many areas. This is just another one of them, because Labor, uh, like a lot of people, didn't think they were going to get re-elected, and so they didn't fund this program into the future, which means that the incoming government has to make decisions about uh, spending priorities. Obviously, the budget is uh, Tuesday week, tomorrow week, uh, and uh, there hasn't been any announcement that youth connections or partnership brokers uh, will be abolished. There is certainly a campaign being waged by those people uh, in Youth Connections and Partnership Brokers to keep them uh, open. Uh, the government's priorities are to ensure that we have uh, either employment options for young people if they leave school, or apprenticeships and traineeships, uh, or alternatively stay at school until they finish till they're 18. Uh, and one of the things that I want to do as Higher Education Minister uh, is ensure that as many people as possible can access university who want to. Now, one of the great things in the last few years that uh, has been available at university are uh, enabling courses and uh, sub-bachelor or diploma courses, which give people who are first-generation university goers the opportunity to get to university, even if they haven't finished Year 12. Mr. So Pike, are... kind of, we'll go to the university issues later because there are plenty of people with questions on that, but will you keep this program alive or...? Will you, in fact, stop funding it, as everyone is expecting? There's been a whole series of stories in the newspapers where Riley comes from saying this program is dead in the water. Uh, well, that's very emotive language. Uh, the budget hasn't been released yet. It'll be released Tuesday You week. want to keep it going? Uh, well, what I want to do is make sure that uh, the government provides opportunities for young people to either be in training, apprenticeships, university or jobs. And the, the entire suite of policies that we will announce uh, next week uh, will, I hope, and I think most people hope, uh, lead in that direction. Now, whether youth connections or partnership brokers in their current form continue uh, is something that we'll discover next Tuesday, and I can't preempt the budget. OK, well, I'm I just going to say that... Just before you uh, go on, I just want to go back to Riley, who asked the question. You've heard what the Minister is saying. What are your thoughts? Um... Honestly, it seems to me that you don't really have any concerns to, for us kids if this, you know, if Youth Connections does stop getting funded. Well, Youth Connections didn't exist before 2010 and governments, whether they were Labor or Liberal, obviously cared about young people 
uh, leaving school or being in school. So, uh, well, Labor was in power for the three years before 2010, so that laughter must have been for the Labor government as well. But what I'm saying is before 2010, there were programs in place uh, for young people, but the most important thing that governments can do is ensure that the economy is growing to give young people the opportunity for jobs, and if they're not in jobs, to be in training or university. Okay, let's that hear, is the let's highest hear, priority of any I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's hear what the other panellists say. Anna Burke, you first. Um, Youth Connects has been a fantastic program, and like a lot of things, you, you create programs out of need. And there's a huge need in those areas where there's high youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is running at twice the rate of unemployment, so it's 12%. But in some of coastal areas, you're, it's as high as 30%. So there was a need. There was an identified need. There was a program created. It's been a really successful program. And Christopher can go on about budget, you know, time bombs well, or he's, whatever well, he's, he's, actually, to... he's actually saying you didn't fund it uh, beyond this year. No, well, what I'm... Yeah, and that's what so I'm what, getting to. why you not? didn't? Well, a lot of things aren't funded ongoing because you then ev evaluate, assess and see how the program is progressing. That program is actually working really well and probably Labor would have funded it. We're not currently the government, tragically. Um, <laughs> I say that with, with all serious intent because this is an incredibly serious area. And just to palm it off and say, well, we're going to hope, hoping and praying and wishing isn't going to create jobs and outcomes. Youth Connects is and we would seriously like to see it continued and getting some answers now, otherwise a whole lot of people are going to be laid off very soon who are running those programs and a whole lot of young people are going to be left in the wind and if rumour is right and you've got to hang on until you're 25 to get unemployment benefits, what are you doing with yourselves if you don't have these programs that suit people? Not everybody wants to get to university or TAFE. Not everybody can get there straight from uh, school, Youth Connects has actually been a great brokerage program to help people who fall between the traps to actually progress and get somewhere and, you know, and progress and become great citizens in our, you know, in okay. our great country. Right, we've heard the two political sides. Let's hear from our other panellists. John Roskam, you first. Are, are there casualties that have to happen in a budget like this and, and would you be worried if this were one of them? Well, this might be a very good program. It probably is. Let's wait and see what happens in the budget. Uh, in the coming weeks, uh, but the reality is Australia does face very significant budgetary questions and it's not just about valuable programs, it's about where are the jobs going to come into the future, how do you not inherit massive debt, how do we get to be uh, productive and I'm sure the, the government will make a decision based on all of those things, but let's just wait and see what's in the budget first. Alibi Senna. Yes, thank you very much, Tony. I'd also like to thank Riley for the question. I think it is a very important area. The youth are our future and we need to make sure that we're investing properly in our youth and giving them the opportunities that they deserve. Yes, it is true that it's, it's all speculation at the moment, but it is certainly something that we should be considering and thinking about what we're doing in relation to this area. I'm very passionate about youth issues. I was involved in a planning committee which established ASK, which is a legal advice and referral service for youth in conjunction with the Ted Noss Foundation. And I've also read that Youth Connections program has been very successful. It's helped 30,000 young people and 93% of those have stayed on to continue working after the program. So. Whatever ends up happening in the budget, I think the most important thing is that there are some programs in place to help youth who are the future generation and who will be the ones who will be working until the age of 70 if these changes are introduced as well. Let's see my last panellist, Mark Trevorrow. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, Christopher, if I was in the Cabinet, I might, be, I might be saying, well, what about we buy 28 stealth bombers, which still sounds quite a lot, and siphon some of those billions of dollars towards a program. <laughs> I wouldn't, if I, was, if I were you, Riley, I wouldn't feel too confident by some of the things Christopher said. He didn't kind of answer the question exactly, did he? But it doesn't feel good for, me, for the program, does it? <laughs> OK. We've got a lot of questions on uh, education. Let's move to another one. The next question is from Tom Harmon. Hi, this is another question for Chris Pine. Um, my name's Tom, I'm from Socialist Alternative and the Education Action Group at Macquarie. You've favourably spoken of deregulation of universities along US lines in terms of setting the sector free. 
As a student, this proposal worries me because student debt in the USA totals over $1 trillion and the president there has described it as an economic crisis. On top of deregulation, letting the unis charge whatever they want, the recent commission of audit, God, like, <laughs> recommended fee increases and suggested that students should start to repay their debt once they start earning minimum wage. What's your position on this? And wouldn't you agree that emulating the American model rather than freeing students would limit access to education for, say, the poor and disadvantaged? Christopher Pine. Well, uh, I haven't said that we should have a system like the United States. Well, we have. That's a lie. <laughs> I'm actually quoting you. <laughs> well, it's not a lie, actually. I've well, never we said that we should have a system SMH. like the United States. What Why I've don't we is... uh, let the minister answer yeah. your question? Well, can oh, we I... do that? <laughs> well, I actually haven't been given the well, opportunity to do on. so. Go on. I'm giving you an opportunity. <laughs> go ahead, sir. Uh, I haven't said that we want to have a system like the United States. What I've said is that the United States has features which are very attractive and one of those features is the fact that they have teaching only colleges and obviously research based universities. So they have a diversity in their education system which we don't have to the same extent here. And one of the good things about the, the US system is that because of their colleges, which are teaching only institutions, uh, many, many students get the opportunity to go to college who wouldn't necessarily want to go to university. To the reason, to the, reason the, the reason, now, the reason reason the United... We might just hang on because there's a few people with their hands up and we'll come back to them in a minute, but we still have to hear the end of the answer, OK? The reason why the United States system is completely unlike the Australian system is because we have a world-leading loans program for students. So that... <laughs> no, I don't. Why, why doesn't he do all the answers? All right. <laughs> you, need, you, need to, uh, you need to, as I've suggested, let the minister answer. And what we'll do is actually we've got a few people with their hands up, so we'll quickly go to... No, we'll go to this gentleman at the front here with his hand up. Um, Mr Pine, should we be looking to the United States as an example of what we should be doing, considering the basket case of a country that it seems to be? <laughs> well, I think there are... There are good features and bad features about every system. And one of the great features about the Australian system, which we strongly support, is that we have a world-leading uh, higher education loans program, what we used to call the Higher Education Contribution Scheme, so that students who go to university in Australia can borrow every single dollar of the fees that they pay for going to university from the taxpayer and pay it back on an income contingent loan at very low percentages. So, in other words, university students who have a less than 1% unemployment rate and who over a lifetime earn 75% more than someone who doesn't go to university can borrow every single dollar from the taxpayer to go to university and pay it back when they start earning over $50,000 a year at 2% of their income. It is a very generous loan scheme and it doesn't exist in the United States. And that's why trying to compare Australia and the United States to each other is impossible. But you can say that there are features of the US system which are good features and that is having teaching only institutions like colleges and that's what I said. But what I do think we should do and I, I support the deregulation and the, ex the, in, the entrance of competition into the higher education market because that ensures quality being offered to students That's because competition, competition always ensures high quality as people compete... As people, com as people compete for... OK, I know. Uh, at the beginning of this show, we explained that if people call out, the microphones will stay away from them. That's not the way you get involved in the discussion on this show. People with their hands up will come to. I want to hear from the other panellists, though. Mark Trevorrow. Oh, well, what, what year did you... Get to finish university. I paid, I paid the higher education Did contribution you? scheme. Did you? I'm very happy to do so because I got a fantastic education and I paid it back through my income once I started earning money. Oh, I'm glad to hear. Christopher Pine, the, uh, the other part of that... <laughs> the other part... Christopher, the other part of the... You would have too because you're younger than me. Well, I, I started as a copy boy at the age of 17, so, you know... Christopher, the other what part of that question was about whether or not uh, the hex fees are going to go up and you indicated yesterday that you seemed to favour that possibility? Well, what I said yesterday on the Insiders program was that I think that currently students pay about 40% of their, 
of the cost of their tuition. So taxpayers pay the other 60% entirely, students pay 40%, all of which they can borrow from taxpayers. So there are about 60% of all Australians don't have a university degree. And those people are subsidising everyone at university. And I was lucky to go to university and therefore get that subsidy. I think students can make a greater contribution to the cost of their education, especially since more than one in two will never get the opportunity and will that had. decision be made in this budget uh, briefly? You don't have to well, say I can't what it'll the budget. be. I was but just uh, talking... you, are, you are obviously running flags up polls and people are very interested. In fact, some are scared that they may end up paying as much as the Commission of Order is suggesting. Well, the Commission of Order is a report to the government. It's not a report of the government. In other words, they might make... Well, they've made 86 recommendations, some of which we might adopt, many of which we might not, and some might be partially adopted. Now, let's wait and see on Tuesday how the government responds to okay, the Commission OK, before I bring in the other uh, panellists, um, we do have a, another question. The question is from Rita Hassan. Yeah, hi. My name is Rita Hassan. I'm one of the education officers in the Sydney University Student Representative Council and a member of Socialist Alternative. In my position as education officer at Sydney Uni, it's become, and it's common knowledge, that at the group of eight universities, uh, they're dominated by students from private school wealthy backgrounds. If fees are deregulated, this will mean the group of eight universities can raise their fees as much as they want, uh, and uh, this will mean will further impede working class and low SES students' entry into those universities. In America, where fees are deregulated, uh, there's become a two-tier system where the Ivy Leagues like Yale and Harvard are, uh, again, uh, populated by rich students uh, and everyone else is funnelled into under-resourced, underfunded uh, junior colleges, community colleges, which offer uh, lesser qualifications, which is more impediment okay, to working class let's people not turn your, uh, Let's not turn your question into a speech. Come to it quickly. Yeah, so how can you defend the deregulation of fees, turning universities more into businesses uh, than providers of education for all? Because I truly think that education should be for all and not just the rich. So how can you defend fee deregulation? Okay. I'm going to let you take a breather so the other panellists can I'm quite happy to answer. Let's go to Anna Burke, first of all. Um, well, I must be the oldest one here because I got my oh, undergraduation. Well, thank you. Uh, we had a little musical interlude there while we uh, <laughs> get democracy back on track. OK, apologies to the Minister, apologies to everyone on the panel, apologies to the wider audience watching. That is not what we want to happen on this program. That is not what democracy is all about. And those students should understand that. However, we do see that passions are raised by this all over the place. We've got a video question on this equity issue. It's from Lachlan Hunter in Bruce Rock, Western Australia. Minister Pine, you're trying to deregulate the university and TAFE system. This will mean, for students like myself, that I will have to pay a higher level of tuition fees. For me, coming from a regional town and moving to a city, it carries a financial burden with the high cost of living. Does this really mean a brighter future for every young Australian? Or do you only allow the rich to go to university? Christopher Pine. Well, I'm happy to answer Lockie's question and I'll also answer the lady's question from the middle who didn't get the chance to get an answer because of the interruption. The, the thing about the Australian education system is that there is nobody who can't go to university in Australia because of fees, because every single dollar can be borrowed and paid back in later life. That is one of the great things about the higher education system in Australia. It's not the case that people are from low socioeconomic status background are shut out of university because of fees. It is quite a misnomer and a myth to say so because every single student is capable of, of getting a loan from the taxpayer that they start paying back when they earn more than $50,000 a year and then they start paying that back at the lowest rate of 2% a year. So the vast majority of students get a tremendous opportunity to have a very high income. They have the lowest unemployment rates uh, in the society in which we live and they don't pay $1 back until they earn well above the minimum wage. That is a, that's part of our egalitarian society and it's a part of our society that we will not
be altering under any circumstances. There are, of course, other ways of providing for low SES students. It's these enabling courses that I mentioned to Riley before, sub-bachelor diploma courses, scholarships and bursaries. All of these things provide opportunities for people from low incomes to go to university, and that is why the number of people from low incomes, uh, Aboriginal backgrounds, disadvantaged Australians has been rising for a long time, and we want to continue to see that happen. Alavi. Yes, well, um, I can see clearly it's an issue that people are very passionate about, and I can understand why. Education is an essential service. It's what empowers an individual and gives them a chance to choose what they want to do with their life. So I think the points and the question made by Rita and uh, by Lachlan uh, I've taken on board, that certainly we want to make sure that there's not this two-tiered system where only rich people can access education. But on the other hand, we have to hear what Minister Pines had to say and hopefully there will be uh, appropriate uh, compensation or sort of mechanisms in place like scholarships to make sure that people who think that they will no longer be able to access education will have some sort of scholarships or systems in place. Because the most important principle, I think, is that access to education and access to quality education is not affected by any changes that are introduced. I mean, I've taught at different levels. I've taught in a village school, I've taught at university level and I've taught in uh, business colleges. And that is what's really important, that quality of education is not affected. And uh, I mean, I think the other comment I'd like to add is that certainly we do look at the US as a model that we can look at, say, what the pros and cons of their system are. But when we, that recent uh, ranking occurred of the uh, 100 universities which are under 50 years old, there are also some South Asian universities which performed quite well in Singapore, Hong Kong and South Korea. So we also need to, know, to look at what they're doing and they've put quite a few resources into building up good research infrastructure and good universities there. So we need to also look beyond the US and not make them the only place that we look at. And just one last comment I'd like to make also is about curriculum. Uh, I would just like to add that um, I think it's very important that uh, the Minister, from what I've read, is looking at making sure the curriculum looks at Indigenous history and the Federation, our First Peoples. But it's also very important, I think, to make sure that the curriculum incorporates Australian values and also cultural diversity, because that reflects the society we are in. I mean, we're reaching a society now where 45% of people experience mental health. More than one woman a week dies at the hands of her partner or her former partner, and domestic violence is now the highest cause of death for women under the age of 45. So I'm hoping that the curriculums will be looking at incorporating Australian values and diversity as well. Let's hear from John Roskin. <laughs> Tony, only on the ABC, two questions in a row from Socialist Alternative. But... <laughs> The point is... And only on the ABC, the IPA, to answer them. That's right. I think <laughs> <laughs> That's democracy, Tony. That's the Look, point. Look, certainly, as, as the Minister said, uh, students at university are privileged. They can certainly contribute more. Your education is being funded by people who are not as fortunate as you. You will probably go on to earn higher incomes, to have better employment than those majority of Australians who don't go to university. So I, for one, am all for having this debate about how we can have higher quality universities, how we can have competition, and how certainly those people who can afford to pay can perhaps pay some more. Anna Burke. Um, there's a photo in my office. It's a photo of my, myself and my four siblings. The five of us are all graduates from Monash University. It's the proudest day of my mother's life because she and her generation um, never got to go to university. We're first generation university educated. And I must be the oldest one here because I went for free. You know, and I still, and, and like a lot of people, you know, joined the Labor Party because of the Whitlam era of freeing up universities. I didn't have to go down the road that my father-in-law went to pass his matric twice so that he would get a full scholarship to do his medical degree. I don't want to go back to that day where your education depends on the wealth of your parents. You are already paying 40% towards your education and people are already excluded from university. We do not want the American system. We do not want a two-tiered system where some are better than others. University is all about 
a whole experience. It's not just about coming out and earning a small fortune at the end of the day. A lot of people will come out as social workers and they're never going to earn a small fortune. They're going to contribute a lot to our society. And that's the other thing. The whole society benefits from having people go to university. Even having Christopher go to university. We've all, <laughs> we've all benefited somehow <laughs> through the entertainment factor from tonight, if nothing else. It did remind me about being in question time. I, I, I was sort of, you know, sent, sent back to that sort of, you know, argy-bargy. But it is a passion. You're not the speaker issue. anymore. I know. We, I know. Could, we could and have I, used those skills I for a time. Yeah, we could. I bet you actually there may be another uh, photograph in your office now with a flag being unfilled mm. behind you on this program. There could be. There let's, could let's, be. Let's move but, on. <laughs> but, but we need to be passionate about this issue. We actually... I, I disagree with hijacking a program. But this is a really passionate issue and I think it's incumbent upon particularly the young people and their parents who are now going to cop the burden of it and the burden through the rest of their life paying back these huge fees. Let's yeah. hear from Mark Trevorrow on this. Well, I'm just... Uh, it's very retro, wasn't it? I'm just so <laughs> thrilled, you know, to hear what these young people are saying and what just happened. It's, it's, it's great to see the spirit of protest still alive. I felt greatly relieved. <laughs> Mind you, they, it did go on a little bit long and I might not be able to do my song. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Pine, uh, the protest, obviously, we haven't really got you to comment on that, but, uh, I mean, well, do you... What, uh, there's the, nothing... average hex, the average hex debt is $16,500. $16,500 is the average hex debt. So this idea that there are huge debts being repaid out there in the Australian education system is simply not true. Mm. And uh, Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance and all of them. Uh, I, I love democracy. I was a student politician. It takes Johnny Roscombe and I back to our university days to have these protests. But um, you weren't socialist. Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just weren't. No, we and certainly... The IPA still gets these protests. We certainly were not uh, socialists. <laughs> and uh, I still even got elected without being a socialist <laughs> in Adelaide University. But nevertheless, um, we have to understand the 60% the of the population are contributing and paying for the, uh, f the opportunity that these young people are getting uh, to go to university. And I think it's a bit churlish for those people who get that opportunity to turn around and say, we don't, we don't think we can contribute anymore, when they can borrow every dollar back from the taxpayer and about 20% never pay it back. But the fees aren't going to go up in the budget, are they? Oh, we'll see in the budget on yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, thought so. All right. Let's, um, let's take the opportunity to move on to another topic, oh, although no, it is related. The next question comes from Luke Broadhurst. Luke I Broadhurst. Question. Um, questions for the panel. Considering the upcoming discussion about uh, budget cuts, I should say, in the upcoming budget, the ageing population, the current economic circumstances and the debt, should we as Australians be debating about what we want from government in the future? Can government continue to provide as it had in, has in the past? Yeah, let's start with John Roscombe here. Luke, a very good question, and one that we are now having to have a debate about. I think uh, Australia's had 20 years of a boom. We have become accustomed coalition and Labor governments promising a whole series of things that may not be affordable. Uh, I think we are in a budget crisis. Things have to change. Certainly our debt compared to Europe or the US is not of that level, but if we are to improve our living standards and be competitive and ensure jobs for as many people as possible, we're going to have this discussion. And as we've seen tonight, this is going to be a, a difficult discussion. Things are going to change. People have got things paid for by other people that they are not going to get in the same form. And we're going to have this discussion, which I think is really necessary. What would the public sector look like if the IPA had its own way? Oh, look, what, would would, you, what would you actually change no, Tony, if you had the yeah. power to do it? No, Tony, look, it would be much smaller. The, the Federal Health Department has 4,500 public servants. They don't run a single hospital. Mm. Uh, the Minister's Federal Education Department has 3,500 public servants. They don't run a single school. Uh, for the Institute of Public Affairs, it would be about giving people more choice, allowing competition and giving us the opportunity to improve our own condition, not handing over ever-growing amounts of taxes. You'd still have government. public health, public education? Ab abso look, absolutely. The, the not, not public broadcasting? No, no, the, maybe not. <laughs> uh, 
But look, we said we have a uh, universal health system. I think by and large it's a good system, but we have to have a debate. Should millionaires be able to go uh, to the doctor and not have to pay an upfront fee? I think they should. This is the debate we need to have. Anna Burke. Um, I don't think we've got a budget crisis. We certainly have an ageing population, and it was Peter Costello who actually commissioned the first report into the intergenerational change. And we've been looking at this for a long time. But you've got to bite the bullet at some stage. You do actually have to have that sophisticated debate about, well, what, what do we do? And, and this notion that somehow taxation is, you know, you pay it and you get it back, that's what taxation is there for. Taxation's there to civilise our society, to ensure that the less well-off uh, are not left behind, that we do educate people so we've got doctors and lawyers and social workers out there to provide for the 60% who are funding it. And hopefully, we'll increase the number of people going to university over time, which the Labor government did previously. But we do need to have that debate about how can we ensure that we are meeting the targets that are needed for the population that the population desires. Is an upfront fee um, right in medicine just because you're a millionaire? Or will that reduce the universal access to, to health? And it's not, you know, your wealth shouldn't determine anything. It should be about what we provide across the board in society. Do we need the stealth fighters? Do we need defence? Do we need border protection? Do we need these sort of things? Yes to all of them. But there does come a time when you've got to say, well, what is the priority of the day, how do we afford it and where do we go? And I think that's the broader question nobody wants to actually address. Just you know, briefly, having a budget crisis and a commission of audit and we'll all, all the spookies will happen, what are they going to do, what are they going to do? And then they'll be nice on budget day. Um, one, can, one can live in hope. Um, and can I just interrupt you for a minute? There's a, there's a philosophical element to that question. Of course, there's a philosophical debate going on inside the Labor Party at the moment about whether to abolish the Labor Party's socialist objective, um, still written into your charter, I think it is. Um, is that a good idea? Oh, is it time to move on? And does that mean that the Labor Party is rethinking the role of government? I don't know if we've got that far, and I'm not... And I read that today like I read a lot of things, like uh, I see Cabinet Ministers read about what they're going to sign off on on the budget, so I haven't been part of that discussion. I'm happy to call myself a socialist... But it doesn't mean I think everything should be in, you know, in government hands. But are you happy to see that objective abolished from inside the Labor Party? I'm happy to have a discussion about where we are in modern day society. But I would hate to think that if we took away the word socialist, we're taking away our objectives about, you know, equity, equality, justice, fairness and social justice issues. So I think... People can get hung up in a word and what they think that means. I mean, I could call John a fascist. That wouldn't be nice. But that would be your right to express that exactly. as freedom of speech. Exactly, freedom of speech. <laughs> and 18C still allows me to do that, even here on the ABC, because um, yeah. it ain't break, but don't fix it. You tend not to win the argument once you do that. So let's move yeah. on and let's see what but, the other panellists say. But, but we need to have a debate, and I think everyone's shying away for it. It's my answer to Luke. Christopher Pine. Uh, well, Luke, I think the previous government shied away from that question for six years and uh, uh, in spite of uh, knowing that they needed to make tough decisions about the budget, uh, simply believed that they could keep borrowing money uh, and we, are, we have $123 billion of accumulated deficits. Uh, we have debt rising to $667 billion and when Labor came to power in 2007, uh, they had a $22 billion surplus in the budget they had money in the bank and they had zero debt. Chris, so I, I, think, years, I think people probably have a right now to ask what you're going to do. Well, on Tuesday next week, uh, in the budget, you will see precisely the government's response to the debt and deficit disaster left for us by the disaster. Labor Party. There was no disaster. It needs, to be, it needs to be fair for everyone. It also has to be right for the country. And okay. I think that this will be a budget which there will have to be tough decisions made about our priorities. We have one of the lowest debts in the OECD. There is uh, no now, I, think we've, I think we've explained that if you, sh if, you shout, if you shout, if you shout, the microphones prices, will ignore you. We have a question up the back from a no lady with a hand up. Go ahead. I have a question about the debt crisis, supposed <laughs> debt crisis. <laughs> <laughs> However, don't, I don't want to be 
be associated with some of the other people. Um, according to the International Monetary Fund, the Australian government's net debt per capita is one of the three lowest in the 22 OECD countries. In other words, our government's gross debt as a percentage of our GDP is less than a third of that of the UK, the USA or Japan. So I want to know, Minister Pine, if your government's talk of a budget crisis is really just a way in which to convince people that there is a crisis that doesn't really exist so that you can redistribute wealth away from the most vulnerable in our society and leave them to fend for themselves. Well... <laughs> One of the most important roles of any government one of the most important roles of any government is to make sure that those who need the most help are provided for by those who have the most. As, as Franklin Roosevelt said, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it's whether we provide enough for those that have little. So I went into politics 21 years ago because I firmly believe that the role of government is to protect and support those who need the most support and to let those who can fend for themselves, fend for themselves successfully. In terms of debt, the UK, the US, uh, uh, Japan would all much rather have vastly lower debt than they have right now. Every European country would rather be low debt. The, uh, the International Monetary Fund and the OECD and so on, they rate those countries with no debt and with, in fact, money in the bank as the most successful countries. And Australia was in that position six years ago and we were elected in September last year to return Australia to that position. That is why we won the election. It wasn't because people wanted to continue the failed policies of the previous government. Otherwise, we wouldn't have won 90 seats out of 150 and have our best Senate result ever. It was because the public wanted to change the government and therefore reducing debt, reducing the deficit, which we promised we would do, is something that we will deliver. And all those countries that you've quoted would much rather have very low debt, and that's exactly what we wanted to deliver. All right, deliver let's hear from time. our other panellists, uh, reflecting on some of the questions we've been hearing, <laughs> and a variety of them. Mark Trevorrow. I'd, I'd uh, believe that there was a, um, a budget crisis, or that we had some sort of crisis of debt. If only Joe Hockey could be a little bit more convincing. I find him an unbelievable ham actor who just does not convince me. And I'd also be a lot more convinced if the Commission of Audit wasn't run by a guy who turns out to be a Liberal Party donor and also a Commission of Audit that suggests that they cut the minimum wage by $160 a week. It's outrageous. Outrageous. Well, the government hasn't accepted those recommendations. Well, you'll I hope not. You'll see on Tuesday which recommendations have been adopted. I can't wait for Tuesday. <laughs> Hello, me. me too. <laughs> All right, yes, well, look, I definitely make think... make this job a lot easier for me. Minister Pine, oh, sorry, like... sorry, oh, Thank you. <laughs> sorry, Thank you. Yes, well, lower debt is, is always a very good objective for any uh, economy or in any country, and I don't think the government's going to deliberately concoct figures uh, to deceive us, but um, certainly we have to make sure that any changes that are being introduced are done so fairly and that they make sure burdens are shared equitably. So, you know, it's very important not to bring in too many changes, too hard, too fast, such that, you know, the confidence which is which could potentially be quite fragile is, is sent down. Um, there, I mean, when austerity measures are introduced in Greece, I'm not trying to say that Australia's exactly the same as Greece, but it, it certainly had a spiralling and adverse effect on the Greek economy. So we just need to be careful how we bring about changes which are supposed to lead to a stronger and more prosperous economy. John Roskam, um, which raises the point mm. of uh, the method by which uh, the government may well be raising revenue. Part of that will be to bring in a deficit tax or so we hear. What's, is that a good idea? No, no. It looks like the deficit tax, if we have one, is going to be aimed at the wealthiest. Now, we certainly have to share the burden, but I think if you're giving nearly half of your income to the government already, that's sharing the burden. We have a situation which the socialist alternative might welcome, but which I think is a problem, whereby 2% of the wealthiest Australians pay 26% of the personal income tax. If we're talking about funding health, education, welfare, this is where the money comes from, and these are the people who we have to be encouraging. By all means, share the burden, but we can't succeed as a country. We can't fund the things we want if we're not creating wealth. 
Anna Burke, uh, if the Labor Party had had the opportunity to bring in a tax on the wealthiest people to help pay off the deficit, would you have done it? No. And we don't, we don't have a crisis. Going back to the original question, there is actually no budgetary crisis. Again, it is a... I, I'd love to be as um, uncynical now after 16 years in Parliament to think that Christopher's not concocting numbers and the government isn't concocting numbers, but I'm, sadly I'm becoming more cynical as the years go by. There, there is no, you know, there has been an issue with growing debt, but if we hadn't have grown debt, we'd have had more people unemployed. That money went towards programs to grow employment, to keep people in work, to keep the government ticking over. And when we talk, keep talking about reducing public servants, well, there's still people doing a job. There's still families who actually have to support somebody at home. That somehow this public servant is some anomalous beast that isn't, a, you know, isn't a human being. You know, an employee of the ABC, you know, running around on the floor here today could be seen, you know, as a public sector employee when you look at it like that. So you, there's not a crisis. There is an issue though with revenue and structural change to the budget and where we grow the money that supports all the things a government needs to do. You need to be, you know, strategic about those. We need to look at the ways of raising money to ensure that we can provide all the things that are needed. But it is not just about slash and burn. It's not just about cutting things out because they don't stick with the Liberal ethos. What about a mining tax with teeth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Christopher Pine, um, briefly, are you uh, prepared to defend the idea of a deficit tax? Well, we'll see in the budget next week what the uh, outcome of this speculation is. But well, there's been plenty of speculation been coming lots of from speculation. the Prime Minister, among others, so I'm just asking you to speculate on his speculation. There's been lots of speculation. <laughs> and in the budget next Tuesday, we'll see the final response from the government to all of this, these discussions. The simple truth is there is no easy solution to the debt and deficit disaster that we have been left by the previous government. But whatever, and, that you, and that you've added 68 million Whatever we to do, yourselves. we need to ensure that everybody contributes to lifting the burden of debt and deficit, uh, and that not just the people on low and middle income earners make a contribution, but that everybody makes a contribution, and that it's the right thing for the country. Let's um, go to yet another question uh, around the issue of education and funding and uh, research in this case. It's from Pat Scott. I'm a physicist working at Imperial College in London. I co-lead a collaboration of 23 other physicists from around the world, including six based here in Australia. The Australian members of this collaboration tell me that they've been unable to effectively plan their contributions to the collaboration for the last two years because of the current uncertainty in the research and university funding landscapes here in Australia. So my question is, when are Australian governments, Liberal or Labor, going to provide the budgetary stability and longevity required for Australian researchers to get on with their jobs and effectively compete with their peers internationally? Let's start with our non-politicians first, John Roskam. Well, I, I hear completely what you say, but earlier this program we had someone talking about their program. Your program is important. Uh, in a... I'm not talking about the amount of money. I'm talking about the policy settings. Oh, absolutely. So I'm talking but about stability and longevity. Absolute, not absolutely. But at the same time, we've seen the budget deteriorating every few months. We've already seen the incoming government face a budget situation which was quite different from the one that we saw before the election. We have upcoming commitments in the next five years for the NDIS, for so called Gonski reforms, for increasing foreign aid. All of these things are important, but we're not going to give you any stability or security until the budget is back on track. And as difficult as it is, and while I don't support every measure of the current government to do that, if we don't do that, you are going to be in a worse situation than you are now. John, can I just uh, perhaps pose a question to you? Um, is it possible for a modern government to ignore or to leave with less funding than it needs, scientific research? Is it a special case? I'm not sure that it is a special case, Tony. I think there's a couple of aspects about uh, scientific research. Uh, one is probably the government funds too much of it. Uh, there is a case... <laughs> there, is, there is an absolute case for the funding of some science, uh, but the private sector can have a much bigger role than it does. 
Uh, and these are the questions we, we have to have. Every medical science, uh, physical sciences, earth sciences, climate science, all of these things have claims on the budget. And as difficult as it is for the politicians, they have to prioritise. I'll just come back to our question on that subject because I can see you want to get back involved. So it's really a question of the policy settings, right? It's not even a matter of um, prioritising with regard to, to other draws on the budget. It's a matter of providing funding over 10-year timescales, say, instead of three- or five-year timescales. It's a matter of providing rolling grants instead of grants that have to be applied for a new with a new idea every three or five years. Well, I, I, just on that very quickly, I hear what you say. But imagine you're running a business. If you were running a business, you'd love to know how many customers you had in 10 years' time. You'd love to know what your wages costs were. You'd love to know what your profit is. And, and I like hear to what you say, what taxation but, regime but you okay, all right. I, I, so you have to understand that difference between the public sector and the private sector. Okay, all right. I'm going to um, hear from our other panelists. Start with Anna Burke, and we'll go around the rest of the panel. This is a this is an ongoing and complicated issue, but I think it must be ongoing because it, no, 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 it, it is. On. And the, and the, I'm the gonna... problems the problems happened yeah, under the, your the, government, no, according exactly. to the questioner. No, no, and and he's right. The problems happened under Labor governments too. So I'm not going to shy away from that. I've got Monash University, Deakin Burwood in my electorate, I deal with probably more NHMRC grants than, you know, I actually understand. I've got an arts degree, so it's always a bit of a mystery to me, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, I love my arts degree. <laughs> my, no, commerce, my commerce degree I'm not that keen on, but I loved my arts degree. Well, you got it for free. I did. <laughs> I, I, I paid... I, pay, I did. Thank you. Thank you. I paid, I paid for my commerce degree, though. By then, Hex was in. I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> but certainty is needed. And it is one of the things that we need to do. And um, I'll agree slightly with John, which does hurt, um, <laughs> that we actually need the private sector to get more involved in research and development, but not at the cost of the public sector. And when you have programs that need and collaboration, and that is the way to go in research nowadays, you don't do it in isolation or, comp okay. or competition. You need well, to have certainty. We're running certainty out of time, Anna. I'm sorry you, to... And five, ten years for these grants is a better way to go. Christopher Vine, you're in charge now. You hear the problems expressed by the researcher there. They need longevity. They need to know what's happening in the future. Mm -hmm. Can you fix that problem? Well, I do agree with some of the uh, questioners' points, and I, I am moving towards a system where this constant reapplying for grants all the time and the enormous amount of time that is spent by our best researchers in in filling out forms in order to be able to access grants that we either know they're definitely going to get anyway, especially if they are NHMRC and ARC grants that are likely to be, as you point out, rolling grants. Now, they're no, typically... Well, they're That's typically... Problem, no. no, but we know that some of them will be funded for more than four years because they are likely to take longer than four years to achieve the outcomes the researchers hope for. So I have great sympathy with your view. Again, there are also grants that we know will probably be very unlikely to be funded because only about 20%, only 20% of all the applications for research grants in Australia attract funding. So in uh, other jurisdictions in the world, they have a system where they have a, a, a first pass and if you put forward a, a proposal for a research grant that has no chance of success, you'll be told that before you go through that very onerous and time-consuming process. But I have great sympathy with your view that research grants should be more stable and longer term. In fact, Tony Abbott said so before the election. I was very pleased last year to uh, support about another $830 million worth of ARC grants for the next four years. Uh, there, of course, are research infrastructure grants as well under programs that both the Howard government and the previous Labor government started. And Tony Abbott and I have been very are uh, clear about our priority around research grants, whether they're medical, health, uh, medical and health research grants or whether they are indeed in the humanities, which I, as a law lawyer, uh, think uh, the humanities should also not be forgotten in our society. So, yes, uh, I agree with much of what you've said and if we had even stronger budget position than we have now, uh, and maybe we will in the future, after this next, next week's budget, we'll be in a position to be able to extend the life of some of those important grants. OK, well, given the unruly behaviour we've seen uh, from some of the audience tonight, we've got time for one last question about the democratic process. This one comes from John Malloy. 
Yeah, this is for Anna Burke, but you don't get off, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> On January 2013, Christopher Pine, in a speech to the IPA, said, and I'm reading so I don't misquote you, the Speaker should be independent, they should abstain from their respective party rooms, and when the Speaker is taken from one party, the deputy should be taken from the other. A coalition government will ensure that the office of Speaker is treated with respect, not as a shiny bauble to be used as a bartering tool. The present Speaker has been the subject of a no-confidence motion. Do you think it's time to adopt the UK model of a truly independent Speaker whose seat is uncontested? We'll start with Anna Burke, former Speaker. Former Speaker, I <laughs> couldn't possibly comment on the current Speaker. That would be unparliamentary and would be against standing orders, so I'm not going to do that unlike some previous people did when I was in the chair. Um, I'm <laughs> not going to sink that low. The difficulty with adopting the UK system is they have over 600 people in their parliament. We have 150. If you have the situation where you don't stand someone against someone in 150, I don't think that's democracy. So I'm not sure we could go the complete way of the UK, but I think we need to have a greater system of independence in the chair that upholds our fantastic institution. And at the end of the day, that's what we need to cherish and uphold. We've got a great democracy, a great parliament, and we should never trash it. John Roskam. I, I'd share Anna's view, and I would add, I think in our democracy, you should have the right to vote for someone who will argue for the electorate in the parliament, whether they're in government or in opposition. And what concerns me about an independent speaker is, you are effectively disenfranchising all of that people in that seat. Bellamy. Yes, I, on the whole, agree with what Anna and, and have said, both of them. I imagine um, you've watched Parliament. What do you think about it? Yeah, look, I think it is a democratic process and it's very important that the representatives we elect to Parliament represent the majority views of people and they behave impartially and they are accountable, and particularly the Speaker who chairs meetings and is a principal office holder. That's a very important role. So I, I thank the person, uh, John, who asked the question because it is an important area that we need to look at. Um, statistically, there are records which suggest that Every speak, uh, speakers that have been appointed tend to remove 90% of people from the opposing party. Yeah, so I know it. Uh, we, <laughs> we need to really look at this system carefully. Mark Trevorrow. Well, I, I think it's about, I think what uh, you've said is it is about imp imp the impression and the impression, the most important is the impression of propriety and I do agree 100% that the speaker should not sit in their uh, party room and I think um, at the moment that's, I'm not sure that that's been happening. Uh, I, I do love watching Parliament and I thought you were a great speaker, Anna. Oh, and, and it was funny how you, fe you fell into it, but you did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> Christopher Pine, Leader of the House, does anything need to change? I'm a bit nervous about answering this question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anna Burke throws me out before the end of the show, but I have managed to survive. Well, a few other people did get thrown out during the course <laughs> of the end. <laughs> it's true to say. It was quite a high um, attrition rate um, <laughs> for a Quanda show. Uh, well, I do. I think the Parliament's very robust and I think it should be robust and I think a good speaker allows that to happen and I think Anna, Anna did that very successfully. I think Harry Jenkins did that very successfully too. I think uh, Bromman, the current speaker, is doing that as well and I I How take was Peter. What did you I think take, of Peter's well, I thought he was, a, <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was good, wasn't he? Didn't, he was a remarkable speaker. There you I'm go. just going to ask you uh, the, the questioner obviously raised the, the comments you made at the IPA. I think it was, it was a very good speech, and I'm glad that you've finally found it. It's mostly been hidden. <laughs> and we were glad the, to have you. <laughs> it's been hidden. But you've, uh, it's been hidden so long you've forgotten what you said. Not quite. <laughs> I do think that each speaker has to make that decision themselves. And I think John, uh, John's view that. Uh, every electorate is entitled to have their member in a party room, especially if they're in the government party room, arguing the case for their election is not a, necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if we had a bigger parliament, mm. then there's been no election in the, in the, tour, uh, in the uh, British system that's been decided by one seat. In our parliament, there was one in only 2010, which was a hung parliament, and don't we know it. Uh, so I, I think one, one seat can change the government in Australia and it's very tricky, therefore, for the, for the Speaker to not be contested. And I don't think you'd be a, ever be able to get agreement from everybody, even if Labor and Liberal agreed. I don't know if Palmer United Party would necessarily agree. Uh, or Who's the, the Deputy Speaker now? Uh, Rob McEwen. Uh, Rob uh, Mitchell. No. No. The member from McEwen. No, it's Is not. one it's of Bruce the deputy Scott. speakers. Well, Bruce, Bruce Scott. Scott. Bruce Scott. Bruce Scott. Bruce Scott. I didn't mean to be John Scott. And Rob Mitchell, the member no. from McEwen. No, he's, he's the also second... The 
He's second. Second. Deputy. Well, everyone's He's getting a go. No, they're all getting a go. The process. <laughs> everyone gets a lick of that lollipop. I, I was only asking because I didn't genuinely didn't know. I didn't want to. Everyone. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I think on that, that appropriate note of confusion, it might oh, be a good Lord. time to leave tonight's <laughs> program. That, that, that all is all we have no, time no. for tonight. Please thank our panel. You could possibly <laughs> call them our veterans: uh, Mark Trevorrow, Christopher You're Pine, Pallavi Sinha, and John Roskam Anna Burke. Next week, uh, next week, with a brand new and highly vetted audience, we will be joined by the outspoken Victorian Liberal MP Sharman Stone, the Labor member for Penrith, Alana McTiernan, writer and commentator David Marr, and banker turned author Sat Das. Next Monday is Budget Eve and the speculation will be at fever pitch. But by the following Monday, May 29, we will have all the answers when Treasurer Joe Hockey joins Q&A to respond to your questions on his historic first budget. So we'll leave you tonight with Mark Trevorrow singing oh. The Joker. Oh, I'm seeing it. Appropriate ending to the show. Oh, OK. Until then, good night. Come on, let's have a clap. I want everybody on the panel clapping in a bipartisan show of support. <laughs> There's always a joker in the pack, always a lonely clown. The poor laughing fool falls on his back, everyone laughs when he's down. There's always a funny man in the game, but he's only funny by mistake. Yeah. Everyone laughs at him just the same. They don't see his lonely outbreak. They don't care as long as there is a jester, just a fool, as foolish as he can be. There's always a joker, that's the rule. Fate deals a hand and I see the joker is me. Come on. This song goes out to uh, those lovely protesters. <laughs> oh, and you too, Chris. There's always a funny man in the game, but he's only funny by mistake. Everyone laughs at him just the same. They don't see his lonely heartbreak. No, they don't care, as there is a jester, just a fool, as foolish as he can be. There's always a joker, and that's the rule. Fate deals a hand, and I see. The Joker is me, the Joker is me, the Joker is me. More funding for comedians. More funding for comedians. <laughs>